Greetings, brethren, and welcome to another presentation from UPA7.org. Today we're going to pick up a series on sacred history involving the shepherd's rod message. We'll begin with this topic, the original shepherd's rod study charts, and we're going to show you something that has not been seen before on the internet. We're going to look at the small hunter series of charts. What are those? You may be wondering. So we'll address the following questions. When did the shepherd's rod study charts first appear? So we're going to look at some history of the use of the charts. Are there differences between the small charts and the large charts? We're going to determine that. And why are there extra charts in the small set? We're going to find out some, answer some questions about these small charts that were issued in the late 1950s and, and compare them with the large charts. So we're going to do some interesting stuff here. And then we'll finally address how do we know that this set of small charts that we're going to share with you debut here on this video for the first time are original. So we're going to look at all of this evidence. So I think you will enjoy this and learn some of our history, our history of the Shepherd's Rod message in the recent past. So we'll begin with this thought for meditation. And it comes from a passage, Shepherd's Rod, Volume 2, page 9, paragraph 1. It reads, This book is not published to explain or comment on truths which have been previously revealed and accepted as such, but is to disclose realities which God has preserved through many generations not only from becoming extinct, but also preventing their meaning from being discovered by men of wisdom. Thus, he who controls the scriptures is able to reveal present truth to his people at a time when needed. Therefore, though such truths are originally prophetic, they become new and stand as a direct letter from God to men at the time revealed. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things I do declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Isaiah 42, verses 5 and 9. Hence, it will provide the contents of this publication new, interesting, instructive, inspiring, and converting. The message it bears, being taught by symbols and types illustrated on charts, becomes simple, and all who are searching for truth with the intention to fit themselves for the heavenly garner can easily comprehend it. So we see here, clearly, as part of the role of introducing the present truth, the shepherd's rod incorporated the use of charts that bears the message through symbols and types. So chart illustrations are a very powerful means to reveal the truth. It's kind of a remarkable means when you look at the content on these prophetic charts. And shepherd's rod volume two was notable because it had many chart illustrations that were converted into large teaching charts, as we'll learn. So this is very important, the use of charts. A lot of people diminish them uh, compared to the written word, but they're equally important. And in particular, since the death of Brother Haddaf, we have many, many examples of people changing those charts, which changes the meaning. So we've got a lot of counterfeit charts. So we really want to get back and focus on what were the originals and why are they so important. So take some time pray as we move forward that God will guide, lead, and direct you into all truth through the Holy Spirit. So what does the rod say about the charts? There's actually a couple comments in the symbolic codes. And in 1935, the rod study charts were first made available. And here's a statement from Symbolic Code, Volume 1, Number 17, Page 10. And this was published in 1935. And it announces the prices for the charts as follows. 11 mounted contained in Shepherd's Rod Volume 2 uh, for the cost of $6.75 postpaid. Then there were three unmounted contained in tracks numbers 2 and 3 for $2.50 postpaid. And then the above set of 14 mounted and unmounted for $8.75 postpaid. And then the same charts as above but unmounted 14 for $6.50. So if you go to Shepherd's Rod Volume 2, you'll find uh, many charts, uh, the source of many charts, 11 of them. When you get to tracks 2 and 3, you might say, well, what were those three unmounted, or what were three charts that came from those tracks? Well, 
if you know your rod message, track two was about the study of the uh, horses and chariots in Zechariah chapter six. So that was the chart illustration that's inside of that track that was made into a chart. And then if you go to track three, which is the judgment and the harvest, uh, there was a study on Matthew 13, the harvest, wheat and tares, and then the study on the ceremonial harvest. And so those were the two charts that came from there. Now, what's interesting is these charts were offered as either mounted or unmounted. What was Brother Haddoff talking about? Well, we have to go back to 1935. And fortunately, we have the testimony of Sister Bonnie Smith, who literally grew up at Mount Carmel, moved there with her parents in 1936 and lived there all the way until the death of Brother Haddoff. And she was important as one of the young women that were involved under the direct supervision of Brother Haddoff to color the charts. So she was very familiar with them. And according to her testimony, these large charts were mounted on, she said cardboard, but I think what she's really talking about is a poster board, a firm backing. The charts were probably printed on some kind of a canvas or uh, material or fabric, but were very loose and flexible. So in order to get them displayed, they would mount them on a rigid surface, much like a, a painting or a piece of artwork. And then that way, these set of charts mounted on the poster boards could be held up for display or hung on a wall. The only issue with these is it wasn't convenient to uh, transport these. I mean, a, a large, uh, you know, a stack of poster boards is not an easy thing to carry on transportation. So we'll see how this changes later. But this was the initial offering was a set of 14 charts uh, mounted on poster board or unmounted. That That is probably that you could roll them up. The next statement we found is in Symbolic Code Volume 9, numbers 1 to 12, page 23, published in 1943. And this is announcing the revised 1944 large charts, and it's calling attention to teachers. And it says, the new supply of 22-inch by 28-inch teachers' charts, for which you have long waited, will be available early in 1944. These are to be cloth-mounted, more attractive than the first, and priced at $0.85 cents each, or $15 cash for the set of 20 charts additional charge for the colored ones. Send in your order now. A lot of interesting information here. So now we see it expands from 14 to 20 charts. That's interesting. And they're now able to be rolled up so that and transported through a protective tube of some sort so that teachers could use them and carry out studies in different locations. So, so they're were clearly revised. They were cloth mounted, more attractive than the first. Now, f fortunately, we have seen copies of these uh, of Davidians that are long since deceased, but uh, Sidney Smith was a hunter under Brother Haddiff, and also Glenn Green, one of the first DLI students and a licensed minister under Brother Haddiff, had a set of these charts, and we've seen copies. So we know exactly how they were mounted. They were mounted together with a uh, wooden strip and then it had protective covers and you could roll this up and then insert them into a tube, a protective cube, tube, and then carry them around along with a suitable stand that you could unfold and mount uh, and, and display the charts for a study group. So this was the methodology and we have duplicated that with the charts we have available today. Now, people think, well, wow, that's a bargain, 85 cents a chart or $15 cash for the whole set. Well, remember, this is 1943. Today, uh, with inflation and the higher cost of material and, and printing technology, the cost for a new set of charts is considerably more, on the order of around $700 U.S. So, uh, yes, times have changed. But these original charts are... There are copies of, of them located in locations of various places around the world, and we've been able to identify six copies so far, so we are very certain of exactly what was published and how they were colorized. So we've covered that in previous videos. If you're interested, you could check a link in the description box below for some of the prior videos we have highlighting the importance of using the original charts versus 
more modern day or, or counterfeits that have arisen since 1955. So this is pretty much all the information the rod has about those charts, but they were clearly an important study tool uh, for teachers to go out and share the message. So what we wanted to today is we've been very fortunate to locate a set of small study charts. And what am I talking about? Well, as it turns out that in the late 50s, like around 1953, Brother Haddaf initiated a hunting campaign. And these were Bible workers that went out to track down Seventh-day Adventists who had been receiving Shepherd's Rod literature for many years. So they had a long mailing list. And so Brother Haddaf, uh, the fishing campaign was sending out this literature for, for many, many years to Adventist addresses all, all, all around the country. And so Brother Haddaf initiated this campaign by first selling off some of the property of Old Mount Carmel and then buying a fleet of new vehicles. And the Bible workers went out two by two, oftentimes husband and wife, and visited these addresses. For example, uh, Sidney Smith and his wife, Bonnie Smith, canvassed the entire state of Montana, which is a large state. It's larger than many countries in the world. And so they visited all of these addresses um, and with a set of charts um, and also literature to follow up and, and see if there was interest in continued study in the message. So this was part of that campaign. So the question is, is what are these small charts that the hunters were given? Uh, we heard reports that Don Adair had a set because he was, although not authorized to be a hunter, he was there at Old Mount Carmel and trained in it, and he had a set of these small charts. And we know from a certain individual that has seen a copy of them and claimed to have photographs and, and was offered to share them but never did. So we knew they were in existence, but that set of charts that Don Adair had, the small charts, uh, unfortunately got destroyed in a fire in 2012. So the issue remained, what were these small charts and what were what was the content of them? And how did they compare with the original charts, the large charts that were revised in 1944? Because we have many copies of those. We know exactly what those are, and we've reproduced them with great accuracy. But um, the set of small charts, well, fortunately, we were able to locate a set recently and digitally scan them. And so it is a great pleasure to, today to debut or show you and compare side by side these small charts compared to the large charts and look for similarities and differences. So that's what we're going to do for the next several slides is compare side by side the small study charts that the hunters used versus the large charts from 1944. So here we'll start with uh, the 11th hour study of Matthew 20. And you can see here um, on the left, you have the small chart, and on the right, you have the large chart that has been digitally restored at upa7.org. Now, you notice on the uh, small chart, you, you see the three holes. It was bound up in a ring binder, okay? And these were printed on English linen. English linen was a thin fabric material that they used to make uh, coats, men's coats, and, and dresses for women. Um, and it was probably the best available material to then, uh, available at the time. However, it had the unfortunate property, being a natural fabric, that it would easily stain when exposed to moisture. And when we restored, it, the large charts were also printed on English linen. And when we restored those, digitally restored, we had to remove a lot of water stains or moisture stains. Also, they're easily soiled by use uh, touching with your fingers, the oils off your hands. So that was the one issue with the natural uh, cotton-like fabric is that it, it was easily stained. So it was fragile. These were fragile. And sets of large charts that we have seen are often, like I say, soiled with stains and, and smudge marks from fingers touching the areas. But this set of charts was fairly clean, uh, printed on English linen. And these are unaltered uh, uh, digital scans. So we see that the line art between the two are identical. There's no... Uh, uh, you know, every detail is there. However, the color scheme is slightly different, similar, and typical uh, printed on English linen that the, wh however these were colored, they probably used uh, a natural color, you know, water-based color, and over time they faded. So you see, you'll see this in general, that the colors are not near as bright as the uh, restored versions that we have here. And some of the coloring is not as complete. You'll see more coloring on the large charts compared to 
these smaller ones. And we'll also examine the issue of actually how are these small ones colored. It's not clear who did that. Two options would be that it was one of the two sisters that colored the large chart, Sister Bonnie and Sister Hormel, or it could have been the hunters themselves. And uh, uh, the evidence to us suggests that it was probably the latter. So let's move on. Here is the uh, Zacharias uh, 6 chart, the church uh, to and back from the wilderness. And we notice the uh, line art is identical. The color schemes are similar. And this is an important point here is Sister Bonnie uh, clearly remembers that Brother Haddaf was supervising the coloring of the charts and was emphatic on certain charts. And this one in particular, he insisted that the coloring of the time hoops between the two brass mountains, where you have the various dates, that those were be, to be done in pink. And you'll see in both of them, they're pink. Now, the large chart has the areas of Egypt and the North Country or Babylon also in pink. The small ones do not. It looked like it's maybe a greenish color that had faded um, so, but the importance of having those hoops in pink is, in, is significant because all of the counterfeit charts that have arisen or re remodeled or revised charts after the death of Brother Haddaf do not include the correct coloring scheme. And colors mean something. And pink, as we've described in a previous video, is a mixture of two colors, white and red. And the significance is, is the fitting symbol of a mixture of uh, uh, purity and sin or error in the period of the falling away between the two brass mountains, between the two Pentecosts. So colors are important. So the small charts were consistent with that instruction, Brother Haddaf. Here is Daniel 2. Once again, the line art details are identical. There's no, uh, you know, no adding or subtracting. The color scheme, uh, similar, not as detailed and much lighter, faded out. And that's probably because of, like I say, the, the colors or the pigments, the organic compounds in the, um, in the, uh, in the watercolor paints uh, have faded over time. They're subject to air oxidation over time. So you have a fading effect. Here is Revelation 7, the 144,000, great multitude. Once again, slightly colored on the small chart, but quite, quite a bit faded. Other than that, line art details all the same. We get to Matthew 13. It was never colored. So if you see a colorized version of math, this harvest chart, you know it's a counterfeit. Nobody authorized anybody to do that. The originals were always, uh, as you see them here, uncolored. Uh, once again, identical in every line art detail. We get to Hosea 1 and 2. Um, we notice that there's some additional colors in the small charts. A bluish background and then the timeline, if you will, the sweep of time um, has a greenish tint to it. We're not clear who did this or whether it was ordered by Brother Haddaf. It's very likely, we believe, that the hunters received these charts uh, uncolored and they probably colored them copying or pattering off of what they saw from the large charts, but not necessarily uh, directly under Brother Haddaf's supervision. So this is a likely explanation. Um, we'll notice some details is that you can look over in the right hand side on the large chart. You can clearly see under that uh, hoop of eternity, you can see Brother Haddaf's signature there by VT Haddaf with a date on it, copyright date. And this important detail is clearly visible, large chart. If you go to small chart, you can see the details there, but not as clear. But this is one of the hallmarks of the original charts is, is brother this detail showing Brother Haddaf's signature in there. We get to the seven churches. Once again, line art's the same, but we begin to notice here that some detail is lost in the small charts. If you look at the road, kind of like the cobblestone brick road circling around amongst the various churches, if you look at the large chart, you see really clear, exquisite detail. Okay. If you compare it with the small charts, the details there, but it's it, it's not as clear, um, and that's probably because of the different uh, resolution. You know, the small charts versus being printed on a large chart. So, we see that some of the detail is lost. Also, the fine detail, the shading around the churches and so forth, is not as crisp and clear on the small charts. We get to the ceremonial harvest once again. Line art details the same. Coloring slightly different. You see the 
the the line showing the probationary time circling around on the large charts it's in a greenish tint on the small charts it's in a pinkish tint say so once again we believe that that's probably the result of the actual hunter whoever owned this set of charts did this coloring on their own now this is a significant one this is really significant the temple chart but within it it contains the vision of the golden bowl in Zechariah chapter 4 and this has been a huge topic of controversy amongst Davidians because all of the remodeled versions of this published by Salem, Mountdale, and Waco are all counterfeit. They, they have, when you look at the candlestick, of course, you have seven tubes on top of the candlestick, which is consistent with scripture. But of those, only six go up and over and take oil out of the golden bowl, out of the spirit of prophecy. It's very clearly illustrated. So one of them is on top of the candlestick but does not go up and over and take the oil out and you compare with the small chart here it's the same the same with all the other images in the golden bowls we've clearly shown in prior videos uh look at you can check a link in the description box below the documents in shepherd's rod volume two the timely greetings the answer books track number six they all show the same thing six of the seven tubes drawing oil out so the whole story about who added the seventh to being, of course, none other than Don Adair, who freely admitted it and created these counterfeit charts is, is a well-known story now. So the small charts of the hunters were entirely consistent with the large charts and all of the artwork produced by Brother Haddoff. And that's the ones that we should use. So this is a significant piece of evidence to show that once again, that Brother Haddiff did not make a mistake, but it was clearly intentional that only six of the seven tubes took oil out of the Golden Bowl. Very important point. A lot of people have created mirages and hallucinations and arguments trying to imagine another tube in there somewhere. And it's like I say, it's nothing but uninspired dung. Um, and we should stick to the original. Now, when we get to the uh, Revelation 12, the church and the dragon, we see the line art details are all the same. The coloring's a little different. This blue background uh, over the period of the church with the period of the church with the Bible. So there is some coloring differences. Like I say, we only see this in the small charts. All the versions of the large charts that we've been able to document, and we've seen versions, uh, six versions now, some of them uh, in the hands of individuals, Davidians, some of them, uh, one, one set sh was purchased by an artist out in California in a flea market and then later showed up and uh, displayed as artwork in a museum in New York and also in, over in France. And we got uh, photographs of those. And once again, the coloring scheme of the large charts were all consistent, all the same, no variation. Um, we also located a set of... Uh, of large charts that we were the first to be able to see them in 2015 when um, I visited Baylor University. They had received a set of uh, large charts that were donated by it that had been left in a print shop in Dallas, Texas for over 35 years and never retrieved. And so that they were donated to Baylor and we were the first to unroll these and see them and, and confirm that they were indeed originals printed on English linen that not only were colored the same as other sets we've seen, but also included the golden bowl image that showed six of the seven tubes taking oil out of the golden bowl. Remarkable evidence. So we have all of this well documented. So this coloring of, like I say, the small chart in this with a blue background is probably the work of the individual that owned the charts and not under the direction of Brother Howda. We see that also in this, the living church chart, you know, once again, background coloring on the two periods with the Bible and without the Bible. We get to Daniel 8, uh, line art identical. Once again, we see the coloring scheme of the time road pinkish in the original. Uh, in the small chart, looks like it was faded, maybe green tinted and then faded out. Uh, the green dye, the green pigment that gives the color probably oxidized and, and faded out. So once again, we think that's the work of the individual that owned this set of charts. We get to the world's prophetic uh, history uh, uh, in symbols and once again, slight variations in color on the road, greenish versus pink. Some of the detail, the, the fine uh, 
speckling detail, the shadowing around the mystery Babylon, the woman around her arms and stuff. This is a hallmark of the originals. You see counterfeit charts and they're lacking all that detail. The small charts have some of it, but it's not clearly as detailed, not as crisp and clean. So we're fortunate to have the large charts uh, restored in this pristine format, which all of these fine details. And we see that here in this chart here, the harvest period and close of probation. Once again, details the same, but some of the fine pencil art here on the shadows and the, and the smoke and the clouds is much more clear and crisp on the large chart compared with the smaller one. But once again, the coloring scheme consists similar, um, but the line art is once again the same. But just the way it was printed on those small charts, it didn't come out as crisp and clean as the large charts. We get to the seven trumpets. This one's significant. On the large chart, you notice the various bands uh, of the trumpets, first, second, third. You come around to the sixth trumpet there, you see six of these uh, bands, and they're all shaded. And then you come up to these over here, the letter K circled there, and then you go to the key, and that says the close of probation, and right there they abruptly stop. And then the last section, the period of the seventh trumpet, you see that all those, now add the one, you get seven different trumpets, all that whole section up to millennium is pure white. That's rather interesting. Uh, if you compare with the counterfeit charts published by Waco and Mount Dale in Salem, they don't show this. They show that those various trumpets are alternated shaded white, shaded white, shaded white. And these are the reproductions of Don Adair. And this is uninspired uh, corruption of the original. And they don't show that clear line of distinction at the close of probation. And then the period of pure white during the seventh trumpet. So this is another issue that why we just stay with the originals. Because people have tampered with it. They corrupt the meaning, the, the teaching. Now we look at the small chart. It's not as clear, but you can see the shading there. And very faintly, you can see at the close of probation, they all ended. Uh, it's just not as crisp and clear. If you go up and look between the second and third uh, trumpets, you can see uh, shading there more a little more uh, visible. We get to the uh, seven seals. Once again, line art's the same. A little difference in coloring. Like I say, the, the time rope is colored lightly green. Whereas in the uh, large chart, there is no coloring. Uh, the heart of the earth, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, basically identical. Uh, coloring, line art, and every detail. And then finally, the flood chart in the original has a lot of more coloring over the time various time blocks. Compared to the small chart, very little coloring. A little bit over Mother Eve and some of the... Uh, uh, animals that are shown there but other than that no no other coloring and like you say we th believe this is evidence that the coloring was not uh, was done by the actual hunter who owned the chart it'd be interesting if we could find another set of small uh, hunter charts and compare them I would predict that there pro might be variations in the coloring because of the individuals that owned them but that would be an interesting data point if we could ever find that anybody has a set of small charts, we'd love to compare them. Uh, please contact us at, uh, uh, at the contact information at the end of this video. Now, the large charts had only 18. They ended at the flood chart, if you will. But what did the small charts or the 100 charts have that the large charts did not? And this is the big interesting one, Ezekiel 47 chart. And this is another topic of uh, controversy. Over on the left, we have the original image from Shepherd's Rod, volume 2, page 294. This is the only place in the rod where it uh, talks about the prophecy of Ezekiel 47 through words. And it also includes this illustration. It's, and then you compare over here on the right, you have the hunter version. And you clearly see that this is revised. It's got a lot more detail. You look at the trees, for example, on the hunter chart it's you actually see fruit on the trees and a lot more detail so it's clear that these were revised and this is consistent with brother how to revise many of the charts found in shepherd's rod volume 2 and the large charts in 1944 
included those more detailed revised charts. So this is not a big problem. The question is, which one's the most accurate? Which one should we use today? Now, if you look at the charts Ezekiel 47 used by Salem, Mount Down, Waco, they are all based on the small hunter chart. Now, here's a detail. This is an interesting topic of controversy. Now, we have a study on Ezekiel 47, and we use the original from Shepherd's Rod Volume 2. Uh, you can check a link in the description box below to explain all the various symbols. But the important thing here is that that fountain was opened in 1844, and that section for the Adventist Church, and then Seventh day Adventist Church, and then the section for the Great Multitude. So there's two sections. And if you're not familiar with that, we please encourage you to look at that study. But there's a little detail that Sister Bonnie used to bring up. And we'll highlight it here in red. On the original chart, you see there Ezekiel standing there next to the east gate. Okay, and that gate is closed. Okay, that's the east gate or the threshold of the house. That's where Ezekiel 9, because before that, the truth in the people, the rivulet is teeny. But after that, it opens and becomes a great multitude. So this is clearly after Ezekiel 9. And so that area we want to highlight the differences. Now you look at the revised version, you see now two things different. You see now an angel actually holding Ezekiel's hand. That wasn't in the original. And furthermore, you see the path uh, in the original. It just shows a line where Ezekiel went out from inside uh, that, that first gate, walked, it came around, came out that gate towards the north, which is open, and then came around where he's standing by the east gate. Here in the revised one, it shows actual footsteps, a little more detail. One other important point is here in the original, it shows that gate, that outer gate there closed, whereas in the revised one, it shows it open. Which one is correct? Now, Sister Bonnie argued that Brother Haddaf never published a large chart and put this behind his desk because there were some details that were not fully understood at his time. We could agree with that in the sense that the use of Ezekiel 47 for a movement of God's storehouse in an overall eastward direction uh, would not be understood fully by Brother Haddaf. He died in 1955. Now, it is true in the old codes that they moved the headquarters of the publishing work from California to Waco, Texas, on the basis of Ezekiel 47. And that's a published irrefutable fact. But the question becomes, was it used again? And the answer is yes, but this was later uh, when Davidians reorganized in 1961 to oppose the apostasy of Florence Howdoff. They reorganized, they called themselves the 100% Rod Only Davidians. They ended up reorganizing back in California, Vista, California in particular, Next year, 60, 1962, there was a split with Bashan and Bingham. But Brother Warden kept the original Rod literature message alive there in Southern California until 1969. The Brethren got together and, and voted and decided to relocate eastward to Salem, South Carolina. And the publishing work moved there in 1970. That's an established fact. We have plenty of that very well documented um, in prior videos. So, and it kept the original literature there for a period of about four years until 1974. Don Adair usurped and took over. And there was a split in the faithful reorganized back in California, in Ukaipa at this time. And they kept the original literature. And then later, a group that was kicked out by Salem and Don Adair, some converts from the Jamaican islands, um, we re regrouping, this is in the early 80s, 1983, they regrouped up in New York around the Mountaindale area, but they didn't have any literature. And they later discovered these older Davidians out in California who were printing the original literature. And one of the mergers that we've documented in the prior video, various splinters and, and mergers between Davidian groups, is Ukaipa merged with Mountaindale in 1986, and they moved the printing press from California to Mountaindale. And that's where they continue to print original literature up until about the year 2000. And then they, uh, by 2005, Mountain Hill no longer print a published original literature. And so God had to, out of necessity, move the storehouse to UPA 7 where we could reestablish the original literature and help brethren publish it around the world. So this importance of Ezekiel 47, it's true. Brother Haddaf didn't understand it all. But now we have enough time and evidence 
and facts of history to confirm that, yes, this chart is important to understand, and we should include it in our studies, and also to discuss all the various elements in here, the meaning of the various symbols, the trees, the marshes, the uh, temple, the altar, and the two sections, one applying to Seventh-day Adventist Church and the other to the Great Multitude. All of that's a very valuable study, but it also confirms some of the history of the movement of God's storehouse that kept alive the original message in the period after the death of Brother Hadoff. So very important stuff. So the question is, well, which chart should you use? Well, you can check out our video on Ezekiel 47. We tend to favor the original um, from Shepherd's Rod Volume 2. Now, there's a, some additional charts that were found in the Hunter series, and this is what it is, without question. Uh, over here on the left, we have the Dardanelles of the Bible. Of course, people that are wide awake will recognize that this is the cover art from the track number one. And compared to counterfeit versions, this has much more detail. And it is useful in the sense, if you're ever given a study on the early chapters of Ezekiel, say, 1 through 8, talking about God's thrones, the two moving thrones versus the two stationary thrones, then this would be a useful illustration to show that complicated throne with uh, wheels within wheels and so forth. And um, so that would be useful in that sense. And compare it with the other throne in Isaiah 6, uh, the other moving throne. In the middle, we have an illustration from contrasting the fifth trumpet, comparing what was taught amongst Adventists by Uriah Smith, uninspired commentary, likening it to Syrian or Mahatman warriors riding horses with guns, which is clearly a private and uninspired interpretation, contrasted with the actual picture of inspiration showing this soldier riding a horse with a head, a lion, a fire coming out of his mouth, and serpents like tails. Now, all that symbolic, of course, is explained clearly in track number five, the uh, final warning. And so that illustration comes from there. And that could be useful in a study on the trumpets to compare this obviously uninspired interpretation versus the actual picture shown in the Bible. So that was incorporated and then we have over here on the right, the kingdom illustrated, uh, this picture of the David the rod and Christ the branch from Isaiah 11. And of course, the wide awake Davidian will recognize that that's a study on the kingdom from track number eight. So this is original artwork in the tracks, but was enlarged and made available in the small study chart. So, so that's just what it's uh, the facts of history. It is interesting that these would not be more or less standalone studies organized in a systematic way, such as Matthew 20 or Zechariah 6 or, or the temple chart or so forth, uh, you know, that uh, various groups have put together outlines for. But these could certainly be used in the course of a study, say, for example, on the kingdom or a study on the trumpets. So it is interesting to see. Uh, some of this, uh, what some of those 20 charts composed were actually composed of. So what can we conclude in our review of comparing the small charts with the large charts? Well, the Shepherd's Rod study charts were first made available in 1935 as a set of 14 based on illustrations found in Shepherd's Rod Volume 2 and tracks numbers 2 and 3. The large charts were most likely mounted on poster board. The issue with that is they were not easily rolled up and transported. So that led to the development later in 1944. These improved study charts were revised or improved and made available specifically for teachers as a set of 18 charts on large size, roughly 22 by 28 inches. And they're pr they were printed on English linen and could be rolled up for transport in a protective tube. And we have seen copies of those We've digitally scanned them, restored them. Of course, we reproduce those with great uh, exactness based on the original pattern. And people are available uh, that are interested in a set of large charts. You can contact us. Uh, we're, we have them available here in the United States. Uh, also, well, we're going to be available very shortly in South Africa for the African continent. And we're also working to produce them in the South Pacific. So if you're interested in those large charts, then please contact us. We can provide you with the original. We're the only source of those at this time. 
we can also provide sets of small charts based on those large ones that are quite cost effective and can be shipped anywhere around the world. Later, during the hunting campaign that was initiated in 1953, a set of small charts were printed on English linen and made available for the hunters. At this time appeared a revised version of Ezekiel 47 chart along with three other charts that were the cover of track number one and illustrations from uh, within the rod literature. So those are the facts. So now we know what the small charts contained and that they're in total harmony with the original 1944 charts and even the charts that were published in 1935. We just see an evolution or advancing or reviving or an improvement of the charts. And today we argue that we should use the latest revised and most improved versions using the best technology. And they're, they're nothing in comparison to having a set of original rod start charts for your own study and to share and witness in behalf of the rod along with the original literature. And the coloring scheme under the supervision of Brother Hadoff that seems to be the most accurate and consistent are found in the 1944 large charts. And we have, like I say, we've documented uh, six independent sets of those charts located in various places and institutions and private collections. And so we can verify this to the highest level. And, and we would argue that these are the ones that we should model after compared with the smaller hunter charts, which were most likely colored by the individual who owned them. So that concludes our study. If you have any further questions, comments, or if you'd like to get in more detail comparing these charts, uh, we can make available those I images to interested parties in good faith. If you'll contact us at the address below, Please subscribe to this YouTube channel, Universal Publishing, for future updates. And also, we're going to be releasing some very significant historical information that's never been seen before about the history of Old Mount Carmel. So please stay tuned. Subscribe to this channel. Uh, if you would like to request copies of original Shepherd's Rod track literature or to help set up publishing in your part of the vineyard or to acquire a set of large charts or small charts, then please feel free to contact us anytime. Here's our email, phone number. You can text, call, or connect with us on WhatsApp. That's where we're most active. You can also visit one of our websites, whyparish.org, where we will be posting some of this historical sacred history of the rod message in, a, in a, a series of presentations. So it will be all compiled together there in one place. So please uh, subscribe to this ch uh, website as well for updates. So you can contact our various branches of operation throughout the world, South Africa, Zimbabwe, the United States, South Pacific Islands of Vanuatu, Zambia, Malawi, and we're working on developing additional publishing work in other areas as we speak. We have websites, uh, video channels, social media platform. So take a moment, you can contact us, text, and we can assist you with the acquiring of original rod literature in any of these parts of the world. So we thank you for the, your time and may God richly bless your search for truth as for hidden treasure and to cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils. Godspeed.